I'm sure you hear a lot of hobbyists say, it's the last one, whatever hobby it is. But whoever told you that it's their last keyboard has already shown signs of poisoning. I'm kidding. You know we refer to most hobbies right now as poison and keyboards aren't any different. In this episode, we'll take a step back from photography and do another keyboard build. And this time we'll build a 65% form factor keyboard, the Kano Gen 2. We'll take a look at what's inside the box, go through the steps in building it, along with choosing switches and keycaps, and finally, the sound test. All right, so before we go to the build, let's go roll that intro. What is happening folks, my name is Marvin Gray and in this episode we'll do another keyboard build. This time we'll build an awesome and sleek looking board, the limited edition Percent Studios Kano Gen 2 in the EVA 01 colorway. This pays homage to the Japanese anime titled Neon Genesis Evangelion which aired in the 90s. The colorway is based on the colors of the main protagonist Shinji Ikari's mecha called Unit 01. I'd like to thank Timur Bond for sending this over all the way from Germany, also with some chocolate. Thanks. Alright, so the Kano Gen 2 is a gasket mount 65% form factor keyboard with ISO support, split backspace, and split left shift support. It has RGB per key and an independent caps lock indicator and can be configured via Q and K. There were five unlimited edition colors and two limited edition ones, the Casio and this one, the EVA 01. The group buy went live last March 1st, 2020, and the fulfillment started around late September 2020. The Casio and EVA editions got sold out in less than 20 minutes since they did not make any huge announcements online, and according to the website, the Casio was limited to 20 units, and the EVA edition was limited to 15. Still, it took quite a long time for them to get sold out since in my experience of group buys, limited edition kits get sold out in less than 5 minutes. The PCBs offered on the website were soldered in HotSwap. This specific model that got sent to me is a solder version which I plan to convert to HotSwap using Milmax sockets. You can also raise the angle of the keyboard from 6 to 7 degrees with the use of a foot pad adjustment system called the Acer 1. Sadly, you can't do this without opening the keyboard and adjusting it. Now, in the aftermarket, the unlimited versions sell about 450 to 600 US while the limited editions sell about 600 to 700 US, if you're lucky to even find one. Alright, so let's take a look at what's inside the box now, shall we? The main package contains two boxes, one with the unit itself, which is sealed, and an accessories box which contains the PCB, an instruction manual, the smaller case accessories like the F-plate, the light bar and a diffuser, the stands which connects to the Acer 1, some silicone gaskets, an aluminum back weight and a PVD brass back weight, the Acer 1 which is the circular lock for the feet, and a silicone dampener. Since this is a soldering build, we need to have some soldering gear, a screwdriver with different heads, and tweezers. I use the wow stick and it's a cheap buy but very useful. I urge you to invest in these equipment if you plan on building more than just one board. So let's do this step by step. As always, start by testing the PCB. Connect it to a PC and use anti-static tweezers to test each key socket. This is a very critical precautionary step because this gives you an idea if you need to create jumper wires along the way. This also gives you some peace of mind when you know you're building a fully functional keyboard. Then let's proceed with disassembling the case so we can install the keyboard stands.
The one thing I don't like about how they build the stands is that the connection between the stand and the Acer 1 locks it in place. And you'd have to disassemble the board if you want to adjust the angle. I made a mistake of putting the dedicated F-plate screws on the screw holes of the Acer 1. I had to look for some screws that fit and replace them temporarily. I only realized this when I was missing the screws for the F-plate. So that left me wondering, why the hell does the Acer 1 have screw holes? Anyway, after installing the stand, I added some gaskets, screwed in the frame, and then installed the aluminum back weight to the case. All right, so let's lay out the silicone dampener. And set the case and PCB aside for now. I wanted to preserve the color theme as close as I can, so I went ahead and looked for switches that can resemble the colorway and went with the linear Mito laser switches. Swapped with tangerine stems to get the purple and green EVA01 colors. I tried to get these components locally to avoid issues with paying expensive shipping fees. Unfortunately, I was only able to get 62 switches and went with the Lumia switches to fill in the rest. Lumia switches are tactile switches, so I placed them on the arrow keys and the escape key. The Eva Franken switches were lubed with Crytox 205 grade 0, courtesy of JMK, and filmed with desk keys films. The Eva Franken switches are not too scratchy when left in stock, and smooth when lubed and filmed. I'd probably settle with the tangerines later on, or some Gateron black inks, unless I decide to keep the colors. Really, it's just the colors. In addition, there were a couple of group buys for EVA01 switches at Conostor which are linears and Shogoki switches which are tactiles, so I'm quite excited for that. The other option which I used is the Lumia switch which are tactile switches of a close colorway. The purple is much more leaning toward red than blue, but close enough. The Lumia switches compared to the glorious Holy Pandas sound more high-pitched on stock. When lubed, they produce a thockier sound, but the GHP still sounds deeper. By the way, I'm using a KBD 75V2 with brass plates, which I recently built, and Cherry Profile keycaps. If you haven't seen the video, you can click here. All right, so moving on to the stabs. I couldn't find a color theme stabilizer set, but I had leftover pack of clear Zeal PC stabilizers, so I opted to use that. I put a light application of 205 grade zero on both the stabilizer housing and the insert, and then dunk both the crooked ends of the stabilizer bars into dielectric grease. I used some leftover stab stickers from my last build for Band-Aid mods and then screwed in the stabs. I planned on soldering Milmax sockets to get the ability to change switches in the long run, so I used the leftover Milmax sockets. Then comes the challenging part, soldering Milmax sockets onto the PCB. Again, with soldering, it's a progressive learning experience. The more you solder, the better you become. So don't be afraid to try it for yourself. So the way I do it is I attach the sockets onto the legs of the switch and then solder them. It makes it easier to keep the sockets in place, but it's also quite risky when you accidentally push the soldering lead further and the solder goes inside the socket hole. The soldering is quite a pain, especially if you're just planning on removing the switch. It's an entirely different story when a Milmax socket is involved. It's not your usual heat up, suck up routine with a solder sucker. Once you mess up, you'll still be able to remove the switch along with the socket from the PCB, but the socket will be stuck with it, so you'll likely ruin the switch. 
This happened several times with me because the laser switches I bought locally were already desoldered, meaning they have bits of soldering iron attached to the legs, so they stuck with the Milmax sockets once I heated them, hence I couldn't take out the switch alone. I had to change the bottom housing of some switches. Well, lesson learned. I guess I won't buy soldered switches unless I plan on soldering them directly to the PCB. With this issue, I had to use an unsoldered switch which I was willing to lose, and in this case, a spare Gateron milky yellow switch. I did this the laborious way by putting the socket onto the switch, soldering, and then pulling the switch out. Then doing this 60 more times. I'm happy to say I didn't have too many issues with it except that it took really long and I killed a few switches. Then again, I did say it's always a progressive learning experience, right? So once the sockets were installed properly and the PCB set, I put it aside and start assembling the board along with the switches. Assembling the case is very straightforward. It comes assembled so it's easy to just follow the process when you disassemble. And the kit comes with an instruction manual in case you need more reference. Now I built this for every possible configuration of the keyboard, so we can change it in the long run like step caps lock or not, and different configurations for control, alt, and win key. Then comes the final piece of the puzzle, the keycaps. The keycaps I'll use is the GMK First Love keycaps which ran on Groove by last year on September 1st to October 1st, 2019, and was shipped around March this year, 2020. I got this off from the aftermarket as well since I wasn't in the keyboard scene when the group buy went live. There's also an upcoming GMK Mecha 01, which has the same theme as this board, that ran a recent group by last 10th of July to 7th of August 2020. According to GeekHack, the expected shipping date of that set is around March 2021. Now that we've chosen a keycap set, I'll also throw in some artisans I got locally to add some flavor into the build. Artisans nowadays are sort of an automatic inclusion in builds because they add the much needed character on the boards. They can sometimes be bought on shops for limited quantities and on group buys, but most often they are acquired through raffle sales. Okay, so we're almost done. One last customization I go for is to customize the keyboard mapping through the QMK toolbox. You can customize and add layers on the keyboard by configuring a key to switch between layers. You can have layer zero as your main typing layer and layer one as your controls layer. I mapped lighting controls and several app shortcuts on my second keyboard layer. It's fairly straightforward, but it takes a bit of getting used to. I'll link some helpful videos I found when configuring it through QMK. Alright, so now that that's done, the final thing to do is to do a typing sound test. But before we move on, I'd like to thank Helix Cables for sponsoring this video. Helix Cables is a local Philippine custom cable shop that does a variety of cable works. They run their cable requests via group buys and you can ask them to customize it for you. Their customer service is superb and you can check out their Facebook page for more info. Well, that concludes this week's build episode. As always, I hope you had fun as much as I did. Overall, the board looks really nice and feels really premium. Personally, I'm more into using the F keys for editing, so I'm quite partial to having a 65% form factor board 
but the canoe is such a good board to have and pimp up. It's also reminiscent of my childhood days when I can watch a ton of anime shows after school, and Neon Genesis Evangelion was one of my favorites. I'd love to do another build video in the future, so if you'd like to feature your board in one of my episodes, leave a message on the comments or reach out to me through any of my social media handles. I hope you liked this video. Don't forget to hit that like button and that sub button if you haven't. Again, I'm Marvin Gray and thanks for watching. And if you'd love to see more videos like this, please let me know. Peace.